So this installment of Nuremberg Lectures is uh, quite different from the previous ones for both sad reasons and good reasons. So first of all, uh, this is the first time when we hold these lectures after the passing of Louis Nuremberg earlier this year. And for the um, first few installments of the lectures, we had the privilege of hosting Professor Nuremberg in Montreal. And uh, uh, so everybody knows that he was a mathematical giant, but he was also an uh, exceptional person, very kind, encouraging, and uh, with an unmatched sense of humor. And we all miss him. Also, uh, this is the first time that uh, the Nuremberg lectures are held uh, virtually by Zoom. Uh, and while, uh, of course, we are missing uh, the personal interaction, I mean, there is a positive part to that because uh, this year uh, we're able to uh, open the lectures not only to the Montreal mathematical community, but basically worldwide. So we have participants from all over the place. And also uh, this year, exceptionally, we have a double feature. We have, uh, in fact, two Nuremberg lecturers instead of uh, one. So there will be two talks by uh, Evgeny Lukomovich, followed by uh, another two talks by Anton Song. And uh, uh, both lecturers have made some uh, outstanding contributions to geometric analysis. So they proved some major uh, results recently. And we're very happy for the opportunity to uh, hear about these developments from sort of the main uh, participants of, uh, of these advances. So uh, let me, uh, so the first two talks will be by uh, Professor Lukumovich, so they will take place, uh, right, the first lecture will be right now, and then the second lecture will be on Monday, and uh, Professor Song's lectures will be on Wednesday and on Friday at the same time, and the lecture on Friday uh, will be as, as a lecture today, uh, a lecture aimed at a general mathematical audience. So let me say a few words about our today's speaker. So Professor Lukomovich uh, received his PhD in 2015 at the University of Toronto under the supervision of uh, Alex Nebotovsky and Regina Rotman. And after a postdoc at uh, MIT and the Institute of Advanced Studies, he returned to uh, University of Toronto in 2019 as an assistant professor. As I said, he has already obtained several major results in geometric analysis, uh, notably uh, a solution of Brown's conjecture on the while law for the volume spectrum together with uh, Marcus and Nevis. So this conjecture has been open since 80s and that's really a major advancement in the field. So today uh, we're going to uh, hear about measuring size and complexity of Riemannian manifolds. So Evgeny, please. And thank you so much for this introduction and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to deliver these lectures. And uh, during the talk, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. I can see them and I will make uh, an effort to uh, answer all the questions or you can also raise your hand if you press on the participant button. There is this uh, button, there is this icon to, to raise hand. So I'm going to talk about uh, measuring size of uh, Riemannian manifolds and metric spaces. And I will also emphasize connection to problems of, in calculus of variations, mainly to problems about minimal submanifolds. So let M be a Riemannian manifold. And uh, there are two ways of measuring its size that are familiar to us. One is looking at the volume of M or its, uh, 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 or its uh, uh, measure, uh, its Hausdorff measure, and the other is looking at the diameter mm -hmm. 
problem while writing the work. Okay, something went wrong. Does it work now? Oh, I see. Mm, I'm sorry. When I uh, unplugged my iPhones, I actually the pen stopped working. So I'll have to. I knew something would go wrong. So I'll have to turn on the pen, connect the pencil. So I want to make. Uh, Sorry about that. Actually, can I see the pencil right now? Okay, the pencil is connected. We can go back. So if you have a manifold M, then we can look at the... Ah, then you need to share the screen back. You don't, you don't share oh, screen. the screen is not... Okay, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. Now let me share content. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, now it's good. Great, thank you. Right, so we are looking at the distances between variance points, and we take the supremum between distances among all pairs of points on our Riemannian manifold M, and that is our diameter of M. So we can think of uh, volume as measuring a kind of n-dimensional size, n-dimensional spread of, of the manifold, and the diameter as measuring the one-dimensional spread of the manifold. And today we will be interested in looking at some intermediate dimensions, measuring the size in intermediate dimensions. And one way of doing that is by foliating or slicing our manifold into smaller pieces and looking at the size of these uh, objects and the foliation. For example, we can look at the map from M into a different space N and we can measure the volume of the pre-image or the diameter of the pre-image. We can look at the supremum of the diameters or the volumes. So for a map F, the supremum of the diameters is called the Urethon width of F, and the supremum of the volumes we will call the waist of F. And so today, half of my talk is going to be about Urethon width, and another half, half will be about wastes, but interestingly, both of these concepts, concepts play important and interesting roles in problems about minimal submanifolds. So let us first concentrate on the Urethon width of F. So the concept appeared in the beginning of 20th century in the context of dimension theory. The Urethon width, the k-dimensional Urethon width can be defined as the infimum of all Urethon widths, that is the maximal diameter of the fiber, among maps from our uh, manifold M or uh, any metric space M into a k-dimensional simplicial complex. So, Excuse me, can I, can I clarify the definition? Uh, what is, is diameter considered to be in, intrinsic in the pre-image or? Yes, yeah. uh, great question. The diameter that we are now considering is the extrinsic diameter the diameter in the ambient manifold, right? So, so this is, let's say, our M, and then we are looking at some map into simplicial complex, and then maybe um, we pick some point here, and this will be the fiber under this map F, and so we are measuring the diameter, the distance, and maybe this is our fiber, so we are measuring the distance in the ambient manifold, extrinsic diameter. So somehow this uh, notion should capture when the manifold is, can be well approximated by a k-dimensional simplicial complex. So just to get a little bit of a feel for it, uh, well, if our manifold is connected, then the zero-dimensional Urson width is uh, pretty much like the diameter, it's just uh, the size of a, a, a map into a point, and it's, so it could be somewhere between the diameter and the one-half of the diameter. 
but and on the other extreme if our manifold if if our m is a manifold then it is a simplicial complex so we can consider a map to itself and then of course the pre-image of every point will have zero diameter and to see why this concept arose in the context of dimension theory we can reformulate um, the definition of urusun width in a somewhat different way uh, we can observe that the k-dimensional urusun width is bounded by w if there exists a covering of m by open sets so that the covering has multiplicity at most k plus one that is uh, we have intersections with multiplicity at most k plus one at most k plus one uh, elements of the covering intersect and the diameters of all open sets in the covering is bounded by w so for example let's say this is our m and so we want to uh, cover our set oops so that's already i'm not going to do a good job here if i do that instead i want to do something like that maybe open sets like this and we want to have a control on the uh, multiplicity of intersection and now we can use this covering to construct a simplicial complex called the nerve of the covering as follows to each open set we associate the vertex in our simplicial complex and then we connect the two vertices uh, if the corresponding sets intersect so to each set of multiplicity two we have the associated edge and then to sets of multiplicity three we will have an associated two simplex and so on this way we can construct this simplicial complex and then if you have a partition of unity subordinate to this cover then we can use this partition of unity to define the map into the nerve of the covering into this simplicial complex uh, constructed in this way and uh, this map will have the property that pre image of every point will lie in one of the sets of the covering in particular it will have small urusun width and in fact this is an if and only if statement if you have a map into a simplicial complex like that you will also be able to use um, this map to construct a covering with this property and you can see why this intuitively measures our uh, um, understanding of what the dimension should be if you can cover a set uh, by small balls so that uh, there are only uh, multiplicity two regions then it kind of feel one dimension feels one dimensional and so various classical theorems about uh, bounds on multiplicities of coverings can be restated in terms of statements about urusun width. For example, a Lebesgue covering theorem tells us that if you have a unit cube, then if you want to cover it with sets so that the multiplicity is at most n, you will have to have a set which contains points on two opposite sides. You try to do that, you know, with small sets here, then inevitably you will have to have a point uh, with multiplicity uh, n plus one. And so in the language of the Urusun width, that means that the n minus first Urusun width uh, of the unit cube is equal to one. And more general, generally, the relationship between covering dimension and uh, the Hausdorff dimension is described by Spielrein theorem, which says that the uh, uh, Hausdorff dimension is greater or equal than the covering dimension. And in the language of Spielrein, of, of, of uh, Uruston, but Spielrein theorem says that the uh, uh, that if you have the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure of the set equal to zero, then n minus first dimensional Uruston width of the uh, compact metric space has to be also zero.
in the 1980s, Gromov discovered the connection between uh, urethane width and problems in the calculus of variations, namely uh, bounds for length of closed geodesics. So let me define the systol. So the systole of a manifold M is the length of the shortest non-contractible closed geodesic. If you have a mm, torus like this, then the systole will be the length of this short loop on the torus. And Gromov proved that the system of the manifold can be bounded in terms of the k-dimensional roots and width for any k uh, less than m. So this result is true for aspherical manifolds, aspherical closed manifolds, uh, where aspherical means that the high homotopy groups are zero for i greater than one. So that includes manifolds like the torus or hyperbolic manifolds. In fact, Gromov proved this result for an even more general class of manifolds called essential manifolds, which is, takes a little more time to define, but it includes all of the spherical manifolds and also other manifolds like uh, RPN, for example. So the proof of this result is a very beautiful topological argument, but I'm worried that I will not have time to cover it today. I may come back to it in the end if we have uh, time. What really Gromov was what Gromov was really after at the time was a bound for the system in terms of the volume of the manifold. So he conjectured that the urethon width, namely the n minus first urethon width can be bounded for uh, k equals to n minus one. He conjectured that it is possible to bound this by a constant times volume of the manifold. But he couldn't prove that at the time. It was a conjecture and it was proven recently, five years ago, by Larry Guth. So in particular, uh, the bound for n minus first Urson width in terms of volume implies Gromov's bound on the length of the uh, non contractible loop in a spherical or more generally essential manifold. Notice that this result can be thought as a quantitative version of the Spielrein theorem. So, Spielrein theorem that we saw before says that. Uh, if uh, the Hausdorff measure is zero, then n minus first uh, how Urson width has to be zero. And this theorem says that if uh, volume or Hausdorff measure is small, is small, then n minus first Urson width has to be small. So in the same way as uh, Spielrein theorem is true, not just for manifolds, but for all compact metric spaces, Guth conjectured that this result should also hold for all metric spaces. And this is something that we proved a year ago with Boris Lishak, Alex Nabutovsky, and Regina Rotman that for any compact metric space X, n minus first Urson width of X is bounded by the Hausdorff uh, measure of X to the power one or n. And let me mention that uh, recently, uh, a different proof, very elegant proof by Papasoglu also appeared with the same result. But actually, something even stronger is true. It is possible to replace the Hausdorff measure here by a different smaller quantity. So recall that the Hausdorff measure is defined as follows. We are looking at coverings of the set by balls of radius r, and then we take the sum of our i's to the m, and we take the infimum and also we take the limit, the limit as the uh, 
size of these RIs goes to zero. The Hausdorff content is doing that without taking the size of the, the sizes of our eyes to zero. So the Hausdorff content has the simpler definition. We just take any possible coverings, possibly these large our eyes, and we take the infimum of uh, sums of our eyes to the M. In particular, we have that the M-dimensional Hausdorff content is less or equal than the Hausdorff measure of the space X, and sometimes it's much smaller. So uh, even for an n-dimensional manifold for n larger than m, if the space is compact, then the Hausdorff content will be finite, while the Hausdorff, the m-dimensional Hausdorff measure will be infinite. Or you could think also of other examples. For example, we may have a torus, which is very, very thin, but we introduce a lot of wrinkles. Maybe we consider connect sums with tiny uh, surfaces of very large area, but small diameter. Like that. So this is my manifold M. Then notice that the volume of the area of M or volume of M can be very large, something like 10 to the 10, while the two dimensional Hausdorff content of M will be small because uh, this can be covered by uh, uh, balls so that the sums of Ri squared is small. In a sense, Hausdorff content. Uh, doesn't see the tiny wrinkles. It disregards small scale features and kind of measures the more uh, global picture, glo more global size of your manifold. So the result that we proved is that it's possible to bound M minus first dimensional Urson width in terms of the in terms of the mth Hausdorff content of uh, manifold X, or actually, sorry, metric space X. But even for uh, manifolds, this now gives new interesting result in the same way as the uh, bounds on uh, N minus first rules and with lead to bounds on systols, we can obtain new systolic inequalities as a consequence of this inequality. So for example, if you look at M equal to some n torus cross some sphere, then this space is not uh, a spherical or essential in Gromov sense. However, we can bound its system. So if this is a uh, manifold with some metric, so we can bound the system of this space in terms of the now n-dimensional powder of content. So because we have a factor which is essential, then if we look at the corresponding dimension of the Hausdorff content, then we will have these systolic inequalities for a larger class of manifolds than the ones considered by uh, Grom. Okay, so let me say a couple of words about the proofs of this result. Our argument proceeds using a certain isoperimetric inequality. in Banner spaces. This is the story that uh, already started in Gromov's original work in the 80s about systolic inequalities. He discovered that uh, these isoperimetric inequalities in Banner spaces are very much relevant to systolic problems. Usually, uh, an isoperimetric inequality for uh, a in, in high co-dimension is phrased in terms of some cycle Z and uh, some feeling of that cycle, tau. And so we want to find uh, some chain tau whose boundary is Z 
maybe Lipschitz chain, and we want to control the size of tau in terms of the size of z. Maybe if z is k-dimensional, then the power here will be k plus one over k. But interestingly, it is possible to phrase a, an isoparametric inequality in a way that applies to any metric space. So if you have compact metric spaces, y and x, and you have a map f from y into a Banach space, possibly infinite dimensional Banach space, then we prove that there exists an extension f, extension of the little f, which maps x into b, such that the Hausdorff content of the image is controlled in terms of the Hausdorff content of the image of y and this additional map. So you can see how this is, so there's an appropriate power here, m plus one over m. So this is a kind of interesting isoparametric inequality phrased for uh, objects which kind of don't have bounding. And yet we can phrase it as an isoparametric inequality like that. Mm. And then when we have that, then we can use this bound on the house of content to bound the size of the neighborhood in which the extension lies. So moreover, we have that the uh, image of X lies in the neighborhood of Y, of the image of Y, with the size of this extension, of this, with the size of this neighborhood, controlled in terms of the constant times the Hausdorff content of y, the power one over m. So this last part is very much uh, like the uh, argument for minimal surfaces, mm, where monotonicity formula tells us that minimal surfaces don't have long fingers. And this good, close to optimal feeling, isoparametric feeling of our set in the Banach space also doesn't have long fingers. And Papasoglu's proof proceeded differently he considered nearly optimal subdivisions or separations of the metric space X, where he considered sets which subdivide X into pieces of small diameter, and these sets also have a nearly minimal Hausdorff content. And then there is also an argument that somewhat resembles uh, the monotonicity formula argument, which allowed him to uh, show that this uh, nearly optimal separator, separators will have nice properties and will allow uh, construction, of, uh, construction of a nice map into a simplicial complex. So it's interesting that these two results, even though they are about uh, very rough objects and uh, invariants use ideas that are very much uh, from the uh, geometric analysis and uh, minimal surface theory. And let me quickly mention that sort of in the background of uh, these questions and results, there is a conjecture of uh, Gromov about manifolds with scalar curvature greater or equal than one that they're from the macrospo macroscopic point of view are n minus two dimensional. In particular, they're 
So more precisely, their n minus two dimensional Poulsen width is bounded by a constant if the scalar curvature is uniformly bounded. This result is known only for in dimension three and in higher dimensions it's open. And so the arguments that I described before, uh, they are inspired by ideas about how one can try to approach this problem and maybe eventually some of these arguments will play a role in the resolution of this problem. Are there any questions? Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast. Let me now switch to the second part of the talk uh, where we're going to talk about wastes. So historically there has been two different uh, definitions of wastes. One is due to Gromov, where we look at a manifold M and we consider maps into Euclidean n minus k dimensional space. And then the fibers will typically be k dimensional. And so we want to minimize the maximal volume of the fiber. So this is my point x, this is f inverse of x. And then there's been a different definition due to Algren in the 60s, which is more general than Gromov's because Algren allowed these uh, foliating objects, surfaces, to intersect each other, to move back and forth. So here in the second definition, we consider families of cycles which start at the zero cycle, but then they can move forward and backwards and they don't form any foliation. Eventually, these families of cycles contract to a point, but in between, they can move back and forth quite wildly and intersect each other. So these are families of Lipschitz cycles and uh, the metric that we consider in the space is the metric of uh, flat norm or flat topology, which means that we consider two cycles close to each other if between them there is a small amount of volume, or more precisely, if there is a chain of small volume whose boundary is the difference between these two cycles. That's the type of topology we consider. And so the uh, Almgren waste considers more general families of cycles. In particular, a priori, it may happen that the Almgren waste is smaller than the Gromov waste. In codimension one, this does not happen. So this is something that we proved with Greg Chambers that the n minus first Algorithm waste is equal to n minus first Gromov wastes. And interestingly, this has applications to some questions about minimal surfaces. We use this result to prove existence of minimal hypersurfaces of finite volume in manifolds of high finite volume. And a little bit later, I will discuss some applications to regularity of minimal surfaces that follows from this result. But uh, this is a result in codimension one and in high codimension, it is open whether these two wastes coincide. And I think that's a very interesting question. And if one can uh, prove that they are equal, it will have some applications to 
theory of minimal submanifolds. Let me go make a quick review of uh, facts that we know about wastes. So let's start with some very basic questions. Can we actually compute wastes of simple objects like spheres? So there's a result of Almgren and uh, a different later proof by Gromov that the waste of the standard round sphere is what you would expect. You cannot construct a better foliation than by just projecting your sphere SN onto the coordinate plane. This will be the optimal sweep out or a foliation. Interestingly, both of the proofs are quite involved. So, uh, so this result follows from Algren, Algren's work in the 60s on minimal surfaces, which is a quite uh, uh, a big undertaking and uh, a more modern Gromov proof, Gromov's proof, which uses more topological methods and generalizations of Borsa-Coulomb theorem and some clever choices of densities on this sphere is also quite involved. This result seems rather basic and it seems that there should be a simple proof of it, but so far there isn't. And uh, Larry Guth called this uh, result one of the most underappreciated. So there was a question from uh, Boris Leshak. How important is it that the codomain is R and minus K and not an arbitrary manifold? Okay, yes, thank, thank you for that question. So, uh, from the point of view of minimal surface theory, we would like the, uh, the map to be to some manifold, not a simplicial complex, because if we map to an arbitrary simplicial complex, then the fibers will not form a nice family of cycles. But it could be a map to any, uh, to any simplicial complex. So the Almgren's proof here will work even if we change the, the map to be not into R and minus K, but to into, uh, in fact, uh, any manifold. Almgren, Almgren's proof will work. I think Gromov's proof may not work here. I'm not, not sure, but I, one needs to modify some things about our arg arguments in Gromov's proof to make it work, I believe. Whereas Almgren's proof will, will work the same. Uh, yeah, so there are some, there are some minor differences. Uh, from the Almgren's uh, theory point of view, if you map to a different space, not into Rn minus K, the, then you may end up in a different connected component of the space of cycles. And then you might, might get a somewhat different waste. So there will be some differences, but I think the theory is there to tackle and calculate uh, wastes in a similar way to how you would calculate wastes for Almgren that you can think of as uh, sweep outs that start on the, on the zero cycle. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so let me mention some other results. Uh, yes, just for comparison, notice that if, for, if you replace the sphere with the cube, then uh, in codimension one, then the fact that the uh, waste of the cube is equal to one is a consequence of Hadwiger's isoparametric inequality, but in higher dimension, the problem is open. We don't know what are wastes of the standard cube. If we now go away from sharp inequalities and just ask for inequality with some constant, then there are many interesting results in that direction. One of them is that for an open set in Rn, you can bound its wastes in terms of its volume. That's a result of Larry Guth. And then if you go from subsets over N to Riemannian manifolds, then there is a wonderful result of Balashev and Sabaru for Riemannian surfaces that says that for any Riemannian metric on the surface, you can control the one waste in terms of the genus and the area of the surface. And this result is actually sharp up to this constant C. There are examples 
whose waists, one waist grow like the product of the square of the genus times the square of the area. In higher dimension, you need some extra assumptions to uh, say something about co-dimension one waste. So for example, if you know that the Ricci is not negative, then you can bound the co-dimension one waste in terms of the volume. That's a result of Stefan Sabaru, and we independently proved that with Parker Glenady. And more generally, you can bound uh, the one waste of the manifold in terms of uh, its volume in a certain conformal invariant called minimal conformal volume, which also appears in the study of eigenvalues of the Laplacian, bounds for the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. And uh, this, uh, this conformal invariant in, in case of surfaces is actually equal to the genus. So you can think about this result as a sort of generalization of the theorem of Balashev and Sabaru. Now you may ask questions about high co-dimension wastes, and here uh, the field is widely open, uh, widely open. So in particular, there is a question of Guth, maybe you know, the first uh, question to try to understand is whether you can control one waste of a three manifold, for example, a three sphere in terms of this, its volume or not, whether you can control, whether you can slice uh, an arbitrary free sphere with any metric by one dimensional cycles whose length is controlled in terms of the volume? Probably not. Probably three dimensional metrics are too uh, wild for to have such a control. If you assume that the reach of curvature is positive, then yes, you can do that. You can get this bound. This is something that we proved with Shin Zhu. So this is a quick, rather quick overview of things that we, uh, quick and incomplete overview of things that we know about wastes of various manifolds. Let me now digress a little bit into the connection between wastes and minimal surfaces. So the idea that these optimal foliations, optimal sweep outs are helpful to construction of minimal surfaces goes back to Birkov, who wanted to construct a closed geodesic on a two-dimensional sphere. So if you have a manifold M, which is the two-dimensional sphere with a Riemannian metric, you can consider a family of closed curves, which starts on one side and then contracts on the other side, and then maybe you want to simultaneously tighten these curves to make them all as small as possible, as short as possible. So you can consider a uh, family of curves like that, and you can take a sequence of families with the maximum, the longest curve in this family, becoming as small as possible, that is converging to the waist of this manifold. And the idea is that the curves that can be contracted to a point, say curves that are close to the left side, well, they will go to the left side and contract to a point. And then the curves that are close to the right side here, they will contract to the point. But there will be some curve in the middle which will not know whether to go left or right. And so it will become straighter and straighter and straighter until it converges to a geodesic. So the idea is that the maximal curve, this is the ITI, maximal curve, as it becomes smaller and smaller, actually converges to a closed geodesic. Another picture that people often look at is following a uh, drawing where we can we are trying to think of our space of cycles as this large space and we think of uh, families 
of closed curves as these non-contractible loops in the space of cycles. So each point here, so this is a sweep out, CT. Each point here represents a cycle. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the uh, volume of the maximal cycle in this family as small as possible. And so if you picture the volume here as the height, then what we are trying to do is we're trying to push these families of cycles down. And as we push them further and further down, the maximal objects will eventually converge to the point where they can no longer go down and that point will look like the saddle point. So it will be a critical point of the volume function. Of the volume function. And so this critical point of the volume functional should be a minimal submanifold. So these are nice pictures and they give the intuition, but of course the details are uh, more complicated. In any case, let me mention some of the results where, which uh, show that this program and this intuition is correct. So the first one due to Pitts and kalabich sau is that if you have any Riemannian two sphere and you can and you consider a family of one dimensional cycles, then as you take the sequence with the maximum converging to the waist of the sphere, to the Angren waist of the sphere, then one of the uh, a subsequence of curves here will converge to a geodesic. And this geodesic will have nice properties. It will have at most one self-intersection. And if the uh, sphere is positively curved, it will actually uh, be embedded. So let me draw you a picture of how it can happen that the waist, the Algren waist, is realized as the length of a curve with one self-intersection. Why this one self-intersection can actually happen. So if you have something like this, which looks somewhat like a three-legged starfish, and if you try to find an optimal sweep out of this sphere by cycles, then this optimal sweep out at some point will have a a cycle splitting into two cycles. So the sweep out that only consists of embedded cycles, embedded curves will not be optimal. The optimal one will have the split. And when you do the min max procedure, then the largest guy actually, and the one that converges to geodesic will be this figure eight geodesic. Close geodesic with one self-intersection point. Let's now look at higher dimensions. So it is a monumental result of Almgren, Pitts, Shane, and Simon that uh, in dimensions between three and seven, closed Riemannian manifolds contain smooth embedded closed minimal hypersurfaces. And for larger dimensions, uh, there could be a singular set, but that singular set will have small dimension. It will have dimension n minus eight. And let me mention a recent result that says that under some conditions, these uh, singularities can be perturbed away. So this is a recent paper with Otis Chodish and Lucas Polaor that for a generic metric on an eight-dimensional manifold, there exists a closed embedded minimal hypersurface with at most one singular point. And if each is positive, then the minimal hypersurface is smooth. So rather interestingly, there is a little bit of uh, 
similar picture, there could be a similar picture in dimension eight and dimension two, for some with similar reasons. So let me uh, now talk a little bit about the proof of this last one, res last result, and how it relates to uh, results about wastes. So the reason why uh, we can have singularities is that in the dimension eight and larger, there could be minimal cones stable, minimal cones, that are singular. The most famous example is the Simons cone, the cone over S3 cross S3 in R8. But if you have an area minimizing uh, minimal cone, area minimizing minimal cones have a very nice property that so it's a little difficult to draw a, a seven dimensional area minimizing cone so let me draw it in a somewhat strange way I'm going to draw it like this so this is this seven dimensional area minimizing minimal cone they have a very nice property proved by Hart and Simon that uh, area minimizing minimal cones with an isolated singularity at, at the origin can be foliated to one side and to the other side, if they are minimizing on both sides, by smooth minimal hypersurfaces. Smooth foliation. And because of this, it's possible to perturb the metric slightly and connect part of your minimal surface to the smooth part and this perturbation will be a nice smooth minimal surface in the ambient metric. However, what there could be, what we could encounter is uh, minimal hypersurfaces which have stable, singular, but non-area minimizing tangent cone. So problematic points, Stable, minimal, non area minimizing tangent cones. So it's very easy to picture the ones that occur to uh, one dimensional uh, geodesics in dimension two. These are just. Um, Process like that. There's no local small perturbation which makes this, which decreases the area, and yet these are not area minimizing. There's a way to connect these two points with smaller length. These objects may exist in dimension eight. Unfortunately, we don't have examples but we also don't have any reasons to believe that they don't exist. And if they do exist, then they can arise in the same way as the self-intersection point in the, this figure eight uh, occurs in, on surfaces. And so we want to fight with them. And what we show is that uh, it is possible to make a min-max construction in such a way that at most one point has uh, such tangent cones, such bad tangent cones, and the, in positive Ricci, no points have such tangent cones. So we want to, to exclude them, uh, 
we use uh, this um, relationship between Almgren wastes and Gromov wastes, we construct an optimal sleep out our manifold M, which is optimal in several senses. First of all, it's optimal in the sense that it's actually foliation. It's optimal in the sense that uh, the supremum of the volume in this family ZT is equal to the Algen waste of M. And it is also optimal in a third sense that if you draw the graph of the volume, so I guess it starts, starts at zero. This is your volume. This is T, this graph of the volume of CT. And your maximum is the value of the Algen waste. Then if you look at any two points, a little bit to the left and to the right of the maximum, you will not be able to lower this graph. You will not be able to construct a new competitor sweep out, which is the same outside of these two points, and yet does not have that maximum. So it is somehow the tightest, in the sense, family of uh, cycles. And using the fact that it's the tightest family of cycles, we can rule out the possibility of having two different points with non area minimizing tangent cones, because if they have two different points with non area minimizing tangent cones on both sides, then it is possible to construct these families of uh, area minimizing replacements on both sides. And so, as you consider uh, a family of cycles coming from one side, you can start replacing this family with something like this. And then you can do the same from the other side. And then you can first move this part over here and then move that part over here one by one. And in this way, you will be able to construct a competitor family with smaller maximum than the waste, which contradicts this special property that we ensured our sweep outs coincide. This way we can use uh, the special sweep outs to rule out uh, existence of more than one point with non area minimizing uh, stable tangent points. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Happy <laughs> Rosh Hashanah. Yes, another one. Uh, so, are there any questions or comments? You can either ask them or you can type them. There is a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the waste of the cube is unknown in general dimension. I believe that at least Gromov's waste was established by Clark Tag. Oh, right, 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 right. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's a very good comment. Uh, yeah, I completely forgot about <laughs> the work of Clark Tag. That's right. But I believe that the uh, ambience weight is still, is still open. Yes, that's a very good comment. Yes, the ambient waste is open. Okay, so other questions? So in this uh, last uh, theorem that you've described, so when you're that uh, uh, you have one singular point, so you know that this is a, a cone type singularity. That's right, yes, in dimension eight. And in general, dimension eight high... are special, yeah. I see, and in, uh, in higher dimensions, do you have any uh, description of this singular set of co dimension? Uh, uh, right, so, right, so. Uh, so in high dimensions, what if, if you have an isolated singularity, 
then we can perturb it in the same way. And we can prove that in higher, in higher dimensions, the set of isolated singularities, which is not non-area minimizing, contains at most one element or is empty in uh, positive Ricci. But uh, the non-isolated singularities, and especially if we uh, don't have uniqueness of tangent cones, then we, we can't say anything. Mm -hmm. I see. So, other questions? So, in fact, I have one more question, but it is related mm -hmm. to the first part of your talk uh, when you were talking about the system. Yes. So, I'm wondering if uh, uh, there are similar for higher systems. So for K systems, so when you look not on the length of the cycle, but on the volume of k dimensional volume of uh... right, right. So it's uh, it's not easy to establish. So for example, there is this um, example of uh, so let me find an, another empty page, or I guess I can draw here. So. Uh, so there is a, a kind of immediate counterexample to a naive looking conjecture. I think the example is due to Burago and Ivanov on the torus. If you have uh, a three dimensional torus, then it will not be possible to bound the area of a, of a non trivial um, two dimensional torus sitting inside of it in terms of the volume because you can define a metric which looks like this, you take a cylinder here, you take another cylinder there, and all of these cylinders don't intersect, and you take a third cylinder in the third side. And then what you do is you uh, define a metric which squishes the single cylinder, uh, sorry, multiplies, so you multiply the metric by epsilon in the vertical direction, and then you multiply this metric by uh, yeah by the opposite in, in 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 the other direction and then you will have to intersect one of those cylinders and so even though the volume will be one any non-trivial torus will have huge area because it will be intersecting this very uh, wide cylinder uh, right, so, and, and most conjectures, uh, mo most conjectures here turn out to be untrue. Mm, there are interesting works by Michael Friedman about more subtle conjectures that you can make into about uh, high dimensional systems. And there are also works of Michael Katz, but, but they're kind of more subtle uh, conjectures, more subtle statements. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no further questions, so let us uh, thank uh, Eugenie again for a very nice talk. And uh, so we will uh, continue on uh, Monday at the same time with the same Zoom link, I assume. So uh, uh, thanks, Eugenie, again, and uh, everyone have a good weekend. Thank you.